Hello, this is Valdemar Janusczak, art critic, producer and presenter of documentaries. Thanks for watching Perspective, YouTube's home for classical art. If you go north from India and south from Russia and west from China and east from the Middle East, what's the biggest country you come to? I'll give you a clue. It's currently producing some of the most exciting and potent and out there modern art in the world. And I'm standing right in the middle of it. So, where am I? What do you know about Kazakhstan? It's an ex-bit of the Soviet Union. Well, yes, but so are lots of places. Geography types will tell you it's bigger than Western Europe, the largest landlocked country on Earth. And businessmen, well, they'll know how much oil there is here, and gas, and gold, and caviar. All that is interesting. But it's not as interesting as this. This is remarkable. The modern art they make here makes you tingle with excitement. It's utterly fearless, ridiculously brave. And whilst being extra modern, it's also very traditional. And this combination of ancient ritual and modern experiment is what brought me here. How did this come about? I've flown into Kazakhstan's biggest city, Almaty, where it's teeth-crunchingly cold. Minus 15 and falling. Somewhere in this blizzard, there's a new country giving itself a snazzy outline and a modern look. But it's hard to see it in the snow. Snow makes everything pretty. Even the extra-large monuments left behind by the Russians look sweet in the snow. The communists were here for 70 years. They turned an ancient nomadic culture, famous for its yurts and its horsemanship, into a most surprising melting pot. Because it was so cold and far away, Stalin would deport people here. Koreans, Germans, Cossacks, all the troublesome corners of the Soviet Empire sent their representatives here. And now Almaty is a potpourri of fascinating faces, though you can't always tell if they're happy. My mission is to track down the artists and get them to talk. In tricky places, it's rule number one. If you want the truth, then listen to the artists. The first name on my list is Alma Gol Mendlibayeva, performance artist and very tough cookie. The last time I saw her was in some video art at the Venice Biennale, where she was doing this. When it's minus 15 and you still get naked in the snow, you can only be a Kazakh woman. 
Alma Ghul is planning another of her naked happenings in the snow, and I've latched on to her to see how they're done. So I just said so we need to get a truck that can take yes. this mm -hmm. lot of people. Yeah, we, I need to go to the market. You need to go to the market mm -hmm. to buy your fabric and yes. mm -hmm. drink. Can we get some yes. drink and something cognac more. or something to warm people yes, up? Or? Something. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it, it's not dangerous for the girls. It's not too cold, is it? Or I, mean, I don't want to I mean, hurt it's, anybody it's, doing uh, this. So. Like, like for the seven, uh, eight minutes to stay. In the snow. In the snow, it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where would we go? Uh, we go uh, outside from uh, uh, like where you think the snow piece that you want to do. Piece, where, where would uh, that be? The name uh, of this place, Kamenka. I'm with them. So we have okay. to transport yeah, girls seven girls and, and two helpers. The crew. Yeah, crew and the two, two helpers. Help, two helpers uh, to build these things. To have people to dig the snow. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh, okay. Mm -hmm. Also. Oh. Um, <clears throat> I should go to the market, buy some hot drinks. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> Kazakhstan doesn't feel like a place that's buzzing with modern art. It feels like somewhere with plenty of the 12th century about it. Somewhere tough to live where most people get by in the traditional manner, on hard work and inventive salesmanship. Yeah, no. the dog, dog insoles are like that. The artists can't have it easy either. Look at this man. He's lived a bit, hasn't he? He's Rustam Halfin, a famous presence in Kazakh art. A work of his caught my eye. To be honest, I couldn't really have missed it. Man and a woman are making love in a forest. But, and this is the tricky bit, they're doing it on a galloping horse. So I know what they're up to, but why are they up to it? been given this address for a block of flats in the centre of Almaty. And this is where the godfather of Kazakhstan art, Rustam Halfi, lives. Somewhere up there, at number 56. Rustam's art is energetic. Rarely has performance art been performed this keenly. A Kazakh man and his woman are making love on a galloping horse. Wow! What the two love jockeys are doing is utterly clear. Why they're doing it is utterly unclear. It's an ancient nomadic custom, apparently. Something Kazakh warriors did before battle to give them extra strength. And I'm told one of the reasons why the Chinese built that famous wall across Asia was to keep out this sort of behaviour from the neighbours they called the Northern Barbarians. The Chinese reasoned, quite understandably, that any warrior nation that could pull off this galloping horse feat must pose a threat to any army. Rustam Halfin has made this charming piece about it, and he's called it Northern Barbarians Part Two, The Love Races. Ah, 56. He lives modestly, as all Kazakh artists do. He's 58, and he's had two strokes. They've slowed him down, but they haven't stopped him. It takes more than two strokes to stop a northern barbarian. Rustam, can you uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, w why you made the piece uh, called The Love Races? Любовь на коне. Мне же жена была, была жена Лиза Блинок, которую умерла. 
Ну, я ну, не знаю, детей не было. Так получилось, что я хотел, ну, хотел, хотел понять, чем занимался Восток, восток в смысле, в смысле сексом. Даже говорили, что если не было сексом, ну, ну, ну мне, мне кажется, фильм, мне кажется, мне кажется, фильм, мне кажется, более удался. Ну, а что, ну, что? It must have been quite a difficult piece to make. I mean, it's a very acrobatic thing to do. Проходил службу в вооруженных силах Казахстана. Параничек мой был просто параничеком. Но она взяла своего парня и его взяла. Я деньги завозил. У него были деньги. Ну и заплатил еще. Это жизнь. Video art is just one of Rustam's outlets. He paints too and sculpts and does whatever it takes to get by. As he shows me his stuff, I suddenly realise who he looks like. It's Vincent van Gogh. Van Gogh lived exactly like Rustam. He suffered like Rustam and he didn't bother either with the washing up. I want to ask you about how difficult it is for you to have been an artist. Um, you live a simple life. I imagine that it's been quite a struggle for you. I can't stop looking at his fantastic face to see what's written in it. I know he's had two strokes, but don't tell me there hasn't been drinking too and smoking and some kicking in the teeth. Life hasn't been easy for Rustam Halfin. Art hasn't brought him glamour and cash. But I reckon it's given him the most precious gift of all. And that's a reason to live. Right, it's 12.30 at night, it's minus 20 degrees, and I'm outside the Admiral Nelson nightclub in Almaty. Normally, I'd be in bed by now, but the word went out today across the city that there's a happening happening in here tonight. And the fact is, if you want to understand the real character of Kazakh art, you have to do the night shift. dark to see much, but someone's beating the hell out of some drums and the chicks are loving it. Is this really a happening or is it a Kazakh disco moment? Whatever it is, the punters are happy. It makes me feel old, so I'm going home, but everyone else is just arriving. Alma Gul's taken me out on the town. She needs some things for her performance, and I need to pay for them. We're going to get some flasks to fill up with hot water and perhaps a little bit of uh, schnapps or something for, uh, for the girls in the performance piece. And there's a big one there, it's lovely. Red one, no? Yeah, red one. It's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, shall we buy that one? If, yeah? uh, if you think it's a good one, looks good to me. Yeah. yeah. It's good, no? Mm -hmm. Litre of vodka. 
Was this for the tea? This is the tea. Okay. How much is that? Six hundred. Six hundred. I've been told about a collector here in Almaty who, uniquely in the world, I imagine, has managed to combine the joys of buying art with the pleasures of being a car dealer. His name is Nordlan Smagulov. And I've been told to keep walking down this street to find his place until I see lots and lots of Toyotas. So I imagine this must be it over here. Nurlan Smagulov's private art gallery sits side by side with his car showroom. Back in Britain, most of the art dealers I know would have made very good car salesmen. But here in Kazakhstan, where the pecking order is different, there's just less need to disguise it. Nurlan Smagulov loves selling cars and he loves buying art. Why shouldn't he flaunt the two sides of his coin? What came first for you? Was it a passion for art or a passion for cars? Конечно, я сначала для меня были машины. Машины, потому что я коллекционером стал позже. Сначала я продавал машины, но 10 лет назад я был уверен, автомобили это верх совершенства, это самое интересное в жизни. Сейчас я уже точно понимаю, что искусство более вечно, более ценное. Для меня она займет, наверное, вторую часть моей жизни, больше времени, больше интереса. I was quite surprised to see how many cars there are in Kazakhstan now. Um, I've been here before and there, there were many less. So obviously your business in cars is a thriving business. Казахстан – молодая страна, и раньше автомобиль был дефицит. Чтобы купить автомобиль, люди стояли 10 лет в очереди. Сегодня э, такой потребительский рай. Ты можешь пойти и купить без очереди самую хорошую машину, любую машину. Поэтому люди охотно идут и вкладывают деньги в автомобили. Они хотят выглядеть очень успешно. So all these successful people are driving around modern Kazakhstan in new cars bought from Nurlan Smagalov. But at the opening I was at last night, the artist was behaving downright prehistorically, howling, chanting, gurning, dressed as a 5th century shaman. I got his address, of course. I've been driving for about an hour now out of Almaty and it's getting colder and colder and whiter and whiter. We're going to meet Moldagul Negembietov. He was the chap who was the shaman at the party on the opening night. He's invited me to his house. Don't know what to expect, but I had hoped it was a little bit nearer than this. Here we go. Oh my God. What's that? I think that's him. Yeah. Moldagul, how are you? Good morning! <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Ah. Didn't expect all this. Quite a welcome. I'm very well. Yeah. Not a sight you often see. I've just had a look inside here. They're, they're laying on a whole feast for us, so I've nipped out to get another present, but 
come inside here. We don't get many chances to get inside a typical Kazakh house. Hello. So this is Mogadult family. Oh. <laughs> As you can see, there's a lot of them. This is this beautiful house with a felt floor. Just proper felt everywhere. Really nice and warm, like Joseph Boyce. Yes, yes, Boyce. Joseph Boyce, Boyce eh? Boyce, Boyce felt. Good. Yeah, this is for you. Please take it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's good or not, I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> How many shamans can you fit inside a Kazakh living room? A huge number, it seems, at Molda Gould's place. They call themselves the Red Tractor Group, an artistic collective of regressive progressives seeking, I guess, to connect with their ancient freedoms. There's no doubt, though, who their leader is. Hey! <laughs> well, we had our dinner, delicious horse meat and noodles. We've had Dambra concert. I've seen some wonderful uh, painting, great art, uh, and now, unfortunately, it's time to go. But uh, I want to thank the Red Tractor Group uh, for a splendid afternoon. Thank you for welcoming us so warmly. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go Rahmet. back to England Rahmet. and sing your praises. Rahmet. <laughs> Rahmet. Okay. That's us. So warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're a bunch of lads. So warm there. Bye bye, Muldagul. It's not often you get waved at by a coven of shamans. I must find out more about them. Though not just yet. First of all, I need to get to the bottom of Naomi Campbell. Her touch would be tender. I've flown to Karagandar, two hours across the steppes from Almaty in the general direction of Siberia. I thought it was cold in Almaty, but it was only minus 20, and that's for pussies. In Karagandar, it's minus 35. I wanted to meet Natasha Jew a Kazakh of Korean extraction who'd caught my eye with a video piss take she'd done of Naomi Campbell. What I wanted to know is why someone from Karagandar, where minus 35 is a predictable temperature, should be at all interested in Naomi Campbell. Karagandar is famous for two things, coal and gulags. Until 1926, there was nothing here. It was just virgin steppe. But they found coal. And to dig coal, you need people. There weren't any. So they set up the gulags to provide forced labor for the mines. It was the largest concentration of work camps in the whole of the gulag archipelago. So it's not a jolly place and you wouldn't expect its artists to be jolly types. So how did you get interested in uh, Naomi Campbell? Uh, uh, many years ago, I um, read in Cosmopolitan that 35% of people can relax and dream just sitting in the sea. Sitting in? The sea, in the toilet. In the toilet, oh, yes, yeah. And this uh, idea come. Right. Uh, so, 35% of people can relax in the toilet. Uh, I, yes, no. yes. And that's because, a st statistic. Um, yeah. Fact. Yes. Oh. Many people uh, read something in the toilet and uh, uh, the Naomi Campbell in this project like a symbol of uh, magazines and newspapers. 
this girl uh, sitting in the toilet in uh, pink pyjamas and dream about Naomi. And uh, she uh, say that the Naomi Campbell is very uh, beautiful, she is very honest, she don't like uh, fear and she like because she like animals uh, but she don't she doesn't know real Naomi Campbell she dream about her like a, a shadow or a vision a vision yeah. yeah so were you being kind about Naomi Campbell or were you taking the mickey a little bit were you making fun of Naomi Campbell I don't want to say that Naomi Campbell bad or good girl uh, it doesn't matter in this project um, when person sitting all alone in the toilet she can uh, snatch uh, smile snatch mask take off take off uh, his mask and be honest so actually it's a piece, a project about you, not about Naomi Campbell. Of course, of course. So in the, in the toilet you can be true, you can be honest. Um, and it's one of the few places where you can be honest and true, is that right? Uh, people always uh, carrying some mask, a mask of kind, uh, person, or uh, may, maybe another mask. Uh, but uh, I think that um, only in the toilet a uh, person can uh, be uh, honest himself. So it's not about what I thought it was about. I thought it was about the stupidity of fashion. But no, it's about finding some personal space in modern Kazakhstan. So Natasha Jew loves Karaganda. Good luck to her. She's made of sterner stuff than me. I'm happy to be leaving. I'm much too soft for the land of the gulags. So I've clambered on board the night train to Kazakhstan's new capital, Astana. Reputedly, get this, the coldest place in the country. This new capital is the creation of the president, Nursalam Nazarbayev. You see his face on posters here and there. He's ruled Kazakhstan since independence 15 years ago and seems reluctant to move on. I read somewhere recently he's one of the world's richest men. Astana means the capital in Kazakh, which is useful. The president has built the city pretty much from scratch. There was somewhere here before, but it wasn't anything like this. This purpose-built modern metropolis on the steps looks like somewhere Flash Gordon might have stopped at for refueling. I've come to meet him. Erbosin Meldebekov. Great face, eh? But look what he likes to have done to it. Erbosin, why do you get yourself slapped around like that in these video pieces? Потому что я хочу именно не похоже другим просто, не похоже своим действием менять, то есть только против этого режима только я вот так могу пародировать просто, как мое послание. Потому что и так много рисовали на холсте, с граффити делали. Ну, я хочу на свое тело сделать азиатские круглые морды сделать. 
Центральной Азии после крушения Советского Союза не изменился. Те же осталось первый секретарь Коммунистической партии. Всегда меняется, система не меняется. Если это аналог провести временем, вот в Германии до сих пор штази, до сих пор остался эти хонекер власти. Точно так я здесь как-то пародирую, как, это как моя миссия. So what's the piece actually about then? What are you trying to say with it? Потому что вы видите, то есть, в смысле, вроде Советский Союз ушло, инстинктивно, как животный, возвращается все. Вот это любимое здание архитектуры Сталина, все возрождается, потому что это как привычки. Все равно здесь такой, как фильм абсурда, все перетекается и обратно возвращается. Я считаю, время рисовать мастерство прошло. Всегда э, сейчас задача художников в Центральной Азии более быть активным. So you remind me as a of some kind of Kazakh warrior from the past or something. Um, the way you strip your shirt off in the cold, the way you take the blows on your face. Is that right? Правильно, правильно. Я всегда в этих местах никогда история не менялся. Вот есть замечательный философ Шпенглер. Он всегда говорит, Восток – это коммунизм, сталинизм – это Чингисхан. Всегда я хочу здесь такого ощущения Евразии. Всегда не меняется ничего. Вот такая западная ценность и демократия. Я думаю, в скором будущем здесь не будет. Всегда будет здесь игра как и пародирование. Всегда присутствует, всегда Чингисхан. У нас внутри живет Чингисхан. What do people think when they see you doing this performance in the streets, the slapping performance? They think you're mad, right? Да, 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 да. Именно в том, что когда они думают сумасшедшие, именно я думаю, мой проект состоялся. At the top of this tower, the president's golden handprint has been preserved for posterity. Herbersin and I try it out. It's a bit tight for me, I'm afraid mine's a bit bigger than that. <laughs> what a great view you get from up here of the new Kazakhstan. Now I haven't forgotten about the Kazakh shamans. Whichever way you head in Kazakh art, there's a shaman in the way. Why is that? The man who should be able to tell me is this tall, silent, strong-looking Kazakh, Said Atabekov, the first artist in these parts to don the pointy hat and reach for his mystic thingamajig. Said lives in Shimkent, way, way, way to the south of the country. These are the badlands of Kazakhstan close enough to the borders of Uzbekistan and even Afghanistan to attract all sorts of bandits. I've been warned to keep my wits about me in Shimkent, but with so much snow around, I reckon the bandits are tucked up in front of the fire like everyone else. Saeed's taken me to his studio, where he adopts his secret identity. <laughs> He's put on his coat, his shamanistic coat. The dervishes used to wear these coats made of different bits of cloth. And on each one of these sections, there'd be a Quranic inscription, an incantation, gave him power, potency. And he's got his money box musical instrument. And around his waist, he's putting on this, I don't know what it is, it's a kind of mountaineering belt. So it's obviously nothing to do really with proper dervishes, it's a sort of modern approximation, a rhyming, if you like, with the dervish look. So why do you dress up as one? You like Batman. You know, Batman is an ordinary businessman in real life. But then he transforms himself into a superhero with a costume and he becomes someone else. That's like you, right? 
Не, не как герой, когда я одеваю, мне как бы приходят такие разные там идеи, вот поэтому я использую вот этот костюм. Sir. To be honest, I'm not that keen on shamans. It's one of those words that makes me want to head in the opposite direction. Dressing up in ritualistic rags feels, oh, I don't know, unnecessary, over-earnest. But so many Kazakh artists have gone in for this, I feel it's my duty to explore the shaman phenomenon. Said says he wants to take me somewhere, then I'll understand, he tells me. It's a bit of a way, and with this much snow around, he's not sure we'll get through. Trying to get to the place which they claim Noah's Ark landed after the flood. I'd always thought it was Mount Ararat in Turkey, but no. People of Shim Kent say it's just up the road from them. But it's been snowing all night. We're not at all sure if we're going to be able to get through. But Saeed did a piece called Noah's Ark about this place, this sacred place. So I hope we make it. Saeed brought me to this place called Kazgurt, and he's been telling me all about its history. After Perestroika, some kind of great leader arrived here a decade or so ago and started a community that lives at the base of the mountain. And they have these strict rules. Yeah, yeah, they have these strict rules about how to live here. So you can't smoke inside, and you have to promise that if we film anything, we'll look after the film. So uh, we're going to go inside and see if we can meet the leader and the community. The leader's right-hand man has been sent to guide us up the sacred mountain. It's a tricky journey and I keep falling over. Not only did Noah's Ark come to rest on this slippery hill, but according to the leader and his followers, the world actually started here. Перед вами один из больших наш местности святой плодовитый тутовник. Сюда проходим обычно кран почитаем, чтобы обильный урожай, сироп и дострахан, чтобы продукцию было изобили. These rocks up here, says the leader's right-hand man, were God's first attempt at creating the animals. There's his first go at a camel. And there's his trial horse. At the top of the mountain, I'm ordered to put my glasses, my pen and my press card on a sacred rock because then I'll see properly, write properly, and be a good journalist. I don't want to offend the leader's right-hand man because he's a charming and forthright host. But what I see up here through my new super strong glasses is the human imagination whirring and a new religion being created pretty much out of nothing. And I can certainly see why Saeed Atabekov brought me to this place and why he considers it pertinent every now and then to dress up as a shaman and to shake his mystic thingamajig. The past isn't as far away in modern Kazakhstan as it is in most places. Which reminds me, I wonder how Alma Gould's doing with all those daughters of Eve.
We've been driving around the mountains around Almaty looking for the perfect place to do Amagul's performance. The snow's got to be right, the mountains have got to be right, the light has to be right. It's a complicated business. <laughs> Almagul, the piece you're going to do up here in the snow is called Appa. That means uh, grandmother, doesn't it, yeah, in English? Means, uh, yes, it means um, like gra uh, grandmother. Mm -hmm. uh, so is this piece about this freedom of women? Is, is that one of its meanings? Uh, you know, actually, this is, uh, this is performance about inner uh, freedom, you know? It's not like social. Uh, you know, I, I want to be free, sexy, and uh, no, not about no sex here, no, really. The body is just a, a beauty of, uh, of the beauty of nature, you know. <laughs> For me, it doesn't matter freedom or not. You know, it is like a woman free or not free. It's the question of the everybody. You know, it's not only a woman actually. It's men also. You know, let's let's talk that in Kazakhstan, men not free. You know. All people not free, generally, in all, in all, all planet. Because people are working too much. <laughs> yeah, too much. We are using uh, our body too much. We are using everybody too much, you know? What is really Kazakhstan, you know? What is the... Uh, you see girls, uh, you see what they're doing, you know? I mean, after all this, you can make uh, like fresh decision. What, what is this Kazakhstan now, you know? Because it's every minute is everything changing. You know, one day it can be um, like a f very traditional, and uh, one day it can be very contemporary. You know. Mm. So, how long now do you think before we start? How many minutes? Mm, okay, now girls, I think take a, a hot tea, something, drinks, and that's it. I will explain a little bit, I mean, 20 or 15 minutes, and then we will start. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everybody just had a little shot of vodka to warm themselves up, including me. And I must say, it feels quite warm out here now. First, all you hear are the whispers. Appa, Appa, Grandmother, Grandmother. It's some sort of reconnection, 
with the past, with nature, with deeper things. It rises and falls, progresses and regresses, and so do you in instinctive sympathy. I've never seen anything like it, and I doubt that I ever will. There's a lot of bullshit in modern Kazakhstan. There's a lot of bullshit everywhere these days. But this just cuts through it. Quite rightly picked on the uh, fattest man in the group to get warm again, which is me. But I'm very happy to do that. It's my little bit for Kazakhstan art. <laughs> Look at that. The snow's melting. Looks like spring's here. So what have I learned during this very cold Kazakh interlude? Well, I've learned that being an artist in Kazakhstan is a true act of courage. You're not just taking on the state. That's easy. It's what artists always do. Here, you're taking on the whole idea of a comfortable life or a settled future. These Kazakh artists, they're modern nomads, riding not across the steppes as their ancestors did, but from wild idea to wild idea. They don't need creature comforts. They don't need woolly jumpers. They don't even need an art gallery. All they really need is a stretch of Kazakhstan in which to express themselves freely. And from what I've seen, there's a lot of that available around here. England, good. Kazakhstan, good. Oh. England, better. Kazakhstan, better. English girls, best. Kazakhstan, good space. Oh. Tony Blair. Ah, not survive. Ah.